Sit down, but down. I'm blushing. All right, welcome you all to my talk. As T-Mac mentioned, my name is Patrick. I am the CEO and co-founder of W and also the founder of the Objective-C Foundation. But while, yes, I am the one up on the stage here today, this talk is really about you because my goal today is to play matchmaker. And simply put, I want you to fall in love with crash reports. And uh, hopefully by the end you will uh, maybe see their value and understand uh, their importance. But before we begin, I want to uh, ask for a raise of hands of you who maybe already are you know, super stoked about crash reports, done a lot of work with crash reports. Anyone in here? Okay, a few. That's awesome. The rest of you, challenge accepted. We'll see. We're going to ask the same question at the end and uh, see how it, how it goes. All right. I like to start my talks by detailing what I hope to teach and explain today. So yes, this talk is mostly about crash reports, but we will also touch on other tangential topics, reverse engineering, vulnerabilities, et cetera, et cetera. But in a nutshell, the goal is really to understand the value of crash reports, specifically on the Mac OS platform, which is something that has, in my opinion, been somewhat overlooked, uh, at least in terms of the crash reports on this system. And as we'll see, we can use these crash reports to uncover malware, bugs, and a lot more. Now, I also want to start by talking about who should care about crash reports. And in my opinion, I think that should be everybody. And we'll see examples of all of these, but users should be aware of crash reports when reporting bugs. Developers, this is the one that most people are familiar with, right? They use crash reports to fix bugs in their products. We'll see that security teams can and should also be uh, ingesting, studying, analyzing, collecting crash reports, because there's a host of really valuable information in there. And then finally, hackers should also be really excited about crash reports as well. So now let's look through some examples of that that I hope really illustrate the breadth of the value that crash reports can give all of us. So when we talk about crash reports, most people understand that, uh, and we'll dig into this a little more, Basically, it's when there's a fault that's encountered in a program and it crashes, it generates the report. So users and developers are usually the ones that are going to be spending most of the time dealing with crash reports and uh, making good use of them. So when software crashes, I'm sure we've all been using programs, you know, word processor, browser, whatever. When it crashes, it sucks, right? It's super annoying, it's frustrating, you probably lose work. And so, to you, one of the main goals is, how do I prevent this from happening again? And the best way to do that is to submit a bug report to a developer, and any developer will tell you that if you submit a bug report and you attach or include a crash report, that is invaluable. Because there's nothing worse for a developer, and I write a lot of software so I can speak to this, where the user's like, your program crashed, and give you no other context. We'll see that crash reports have all the specific details about why the software crashed, which is what the developer needs to ultimately fix their tool. So a simple example, uh, I use Hopper as my reverse engineering tool of choice. It's a basic disassembler and decompiler that works really well on Mac OS. And yeah, it has some bugs, especially when I'm pushing the envelope a little bit. And when it crashes, I email the developer and I attach the crash report. And he's great. He's like, thanks for the crash report. And then he turns around and fixes it very quickly. So at the end of the day, that's great for me because the the software basically becomes more stable and doesn't crash when I'm reverse engineering. And for him, you know, again, this benefits uh, his utility and all other users as well. Now, moving on, uh, security teams, in my opinion, should be making use of crash reports as well because a lot of times when exploits fail, what they are going to do is trigger a crash which means then there is an indication of the failed exploitation attempt. And this can, in some scenarios, reveal previously unknown bugs or zero days. So I love this case study from Microsoft. It's from actually 2008, so it's a little dated, but it really illustrates this very, very, very well. So for a long time, Microsoft has been collecting and ingesting crash reports. Uh, I'm sure if you're developing exploits, you know this, you're like, don't crash because Microsoft might grab a copy of it. 
And so what Microsoft does is when they get a crash report, they basically rank them based on the number that are occurring. Obviously, if every computer around the world is crashing, they're going to look at those crash reports first. And obviously, not every crash report results in a failed exploitation attempt. But if there is a failed exploitation attempt that generates a crash log and the user submits it to Microsoft, Microsoft is eventually or probably going to find it. So in this case, they were analyzing their crash reports, and they found one ranked 45 thousandths. So there was only two instances of this crash report. And how they analyze or classify crash, uh, crash reports is kind of beyond the scope of this talk, but you can tell perhaps by looking at the faulting instruction that, okay, this crash report and another crash report are related. But they had only two crash reports from the millions, tens, hundreds of millions of crash reports that they were collecting. Turned out when they looked at it, as we can see on the slide, they found out that the reason that this crash report was generated were that, was that there were hackers using a brand new vulnerability, a zero day, that allowed them to hack any version of Windows at the time remotely, and when the exploit succeeded, it gave them system access. Like, this is the dream, right? This is the best exploit ever. Um, and so, unfortunately, though, the shellcode had a subtle bug that very occasionally would crash, which is why the crash report was generated, which is why Microsoft was able to get a copy of it. From the crash report, they were able to figure out the vulnerability that the adversaries were exploiting at zero day and pushed out uh, a patch. So again, great case study illustrating the value for defensive teams um, that uh, crash reports can use. That was Windows. Uh, iOS is also another platform where there's a lot of interest around crash reports. Uh, there's several companies that have been acquired recently or raised a lot of money. And what they are doing are analyzing crash reports on iOS. Many of you know that you can't really write security tools for iOS, right? Apple is very restrictive about what runs. And so what you are left doing is basically, A, either analyzing network traffic to find anomalies, an implant or something, or B, looking at crash reports to find implants if they have a bug and or failed exploitation attempts. I also think that we should be looking at crash reports to find malware. The idea is that malware, generally speaking, is not as well written as, say, vendor-supplied software. You know, malware authors are just generally not the best software uh, engineers. And so there's some examples of this. First and foremost, Stuxnet, which is my favorite and the greatest malware that was ever created. Uh, unfortunately, it was originally discovered via crashes. It triggered a bug uh, either in the operating system or in uh, the Stuxnet code itself that would cause systems to reboot. This ultimately gave security, inf uh, security researcher enough information to figure out, and this is how Stuxnet was originally detected. A more recent example and one that's more relevant to Mac OS is Zuru. Uh, this is an interesting piece of malware out of China. It has some bugs and in some cases it would crash. So we can see on the slide though that as it was new malware, it was originally undetected. That's not surprising. Most new malware remains undetected. But because it had a bug in it, it would generate crash reports. So if we were collecting crash reports, you would see some unsigned non-notarized persistent process that was crashing. And generally speaking, you would then go look into that and be like, what's going on here? And then reveal that the system had been infected. I also think that we should be analyzing crash reports if you are, for example, a malware analyst. So earlier this year, the rather infamous ransomware group known as Lockbit started to develop a version of their ransomware to target Mac OS systems. I was able to get a copy of it, and I wanted to run it on a isolated VM to test some generic ransomware detection. The problem was the malware had a bug in it that would cause it to crash before it ran to completion. And in this case, that was actually, well, good for users, but problematic for me as a malware analyst because I needed it to actually run to completion so I could test my detection software. So what I had to do was look at the crash report, and we'll talk about how to do this next, to figure out why the malware was crashing. And then with that information that I extracted from the crash report, I was able to patch the malware, for testing purposes only, so that it would now run to completion, and then I could test the security tools. And without the crash report, that would have been a lot more difficult to do. I almost left out the slide for obvious reasons, but I thought it was 
hilarious, relevant, and also based on publicly available information. But according to the media, certain intelligence agencies are also very interested in crash reports as well. And so as the reports show, they basically, they being the intelligence agencies, would, when possible, collect uh, crash reports for two reasons. First, crash reports contain detailed information about the system where the crash occurred. And if you can hypothetically imagine if you also wanted to exploit those systems, having a fingerprint of that system is super valuable, down to the operating system, service pack version, language, et cetera, et cetera. And then perhaps yourself, you could see what other vulnerabilities or bugs were on this system as well. And I love this leaked image because what it basically is, it's a screenshot of Microsoft's crash reporting alert and what the internal documentations, supposedly, according to the press, uh, kind of hard to see, but the, um, the image was modified. Instead of saying, please tell Microsoft about this, and I'll read it because it's hard to say, it says, this information may be intercepted by a foreign SIGINT system to gather detailed information and better exploit your machine. So, hilarious, awesome, but also I'm happy that intelligence agencies, at least friendly ones, are ga gathering crash reports because they are very, very valuable for offensive uh, operations as well. Now, the last thing I want to point out about crash reports are they are really, in my opinion, the absolute source of truth, at least when we're talking about bugs and vulnerabilities. Great case study, we'll dive into this next, is CrowdStrike. So when Windows systems around the world started crashing, who did everyone blame? Microsoft. Right? So the media jumped out and said, Microsoft crash sparks chaos at airports and banks and everything. And like, this turned out actually to not really be the case because it really wasn't a Microsoft bug. It turned out to be a bug in CrowdStrike software. But people didn't know that. So once we got a crash, crash report, though, we could figure out that, A, this was not actually a Microsoft vulnerability, and B, we could actually figure out exactly what went wrong. Unfortunately, there were some people who, even when they got the crash reports, didn't understand how to read that, and so they jumped to wild conclusions about what went wrong, and you know, would you know, basically post a screenshot of a crash report with some lines, and get you know, tens of thousands of likes and retweets, but the information, the conclusions they had come to were wrong because they hadn't been able to understand the crash report. As we see, though, if you understood how to read the crash report, you would see that this wasn't actually a Microsoft bug, it was a CrowdStrike issue, and also exactly what it was. Before Microsoft and or CrowdStrike would come out and confirm what it is. So crash reports, super valuable. All right, I now want to talk about crash report basics. Starting with a definition, we've been talking about the value of crash reports, but like, what is a crash report? Why does it even occur? Well, we can see on the slide, Pretty obvious, when a program, program encounters an error, a fault, causes a crash, the operating system will generate a detailed report containing lots of information about why the crash uh, occurred. And one of the points is that this crash report is really for, designed for developers, so for the average user, it might not be, be obvious. So what I want to do now is talk a little bit about how to understand and read a crash report. We're going to focus on Mac OS, but the content in crash reports are fairly similar across operating systems, so even if you have zero interest in Mac OS, this information should be useful to other platforms as well. So on Mac OS, first question is where do we even find the crash reports? You can either open the console app and click on crash reports, or you can go to either of the diagnostic reports directory and look for any files that end in the .ips file extension. So now what we're going to do is we're going to walk through an example crash report. We're going to start with some buggy code, and from the code, we're going to look at what the crash report is and ultimately show how we could have figured out what the bug was, even if we didn't have the code. Because normally, when you get a crash report, you don't actually have the source code for the, pro for the project or the application, right? It might be malware or some closed source component. OK, so at the top, we have some buggy code, super straightforward. We're basically dereferencing a null pointer, standard. When we compile and run this, no surprises here, it crashes, right? You can't dereference memory at address zero. If you do, this is going to crash, which means a crash report is generated. 
So once it crashed, we go into the console application, and we can see that there is a crash report that has been generated, no surprises here, and it matches the name of the application or program, in this case, I will crash. If we open it, we can see at the top there's some basic information. There's the name of the process that crashed, that's helpful. And then also information, versioning information about both the operating system and the version of the program that crashed. This is super useful because a lot of times, imagine me as a developer, I want to know what version of my software crashed. And once I patch it, if the old versions keep crashing, I mean, that's expected unless I backport the patches. A lot of times, too, crashes are operating system version specific. So again, it's very important to know what version of the program crashed on what version of the operating system. And this information is there. This is also, again, why offensive-minded adversaries are interested in this information because it's a great way to fingerprint a system. The next thing we find in the crash report is the information about the crash threat. Now, most applications, most programs, most daemons are multi-threaded. So it's very important for us to know what specific thread crashed, and that will be shown in the crash report. This command line demo application is single-threaded, so there's basically only one thread, and it's the one that crashed. It's going to be threaded in index zero, the first and only thread in that case. We then have some exception information. This is important because it tells us why the program crashed. In this case, we can see there was a bad access, and it even tells us it was at address zero. So already we kind of know that it's probably a null pointer dereference based on this. Next up, we have the stack backtrace. This is super useful because this tells us the sequence of calls that were made that ultimately got to the faulting instruction. So this is important because it gives us context about what crashed. A lot of times we will see, and we'll talk about this next, the faulting instruction. This is the address of the actual instruction that triggered the crash. But we want to know, like, how it got here. You know, there might be multiple code paths, and one of those code paths has the problematic code, and so that's important. A lot of times, also, we'll see that crashes occur within a system API, and nine out of 10 times, anecdotally speaking, the actual bug is not in the API, it's that the API was called incorrectly, right? If you call a memory deallocation routine with a pointer that's already been freed or a null pointer, like that API is probably going to crash. That's not a bug in the API, it's a bug in how it was called. And so again, the stack backtrace is super important because it'll show you exactly the sequence of events that got to the crash, and the bug may actually be somewhere in there. Next, we have the crash thread straight state. This is uh, the a snapshot of the registers and their values at the time of the crash. This is also very, very important because it gives us additional context. On Mac OS, you don't get like a memory dump with the crash report, so your context is very limited, but the crashed thread state will have the values of memory in the register. And so a lot of times, this can actually show us exactly what went wrong. So for example, and we'll show this next, if there's a snippet of disassembly where it crashes, registers, uh, references various registers, maybe it's dereferencing one of those registers. Well, if we look at the crash thread state and see that register value is zero, we know it's a null pointer dereference. So the crash thread state, super point. Uh, now, the crash thread state is going to be obviously specific to the operating system, or rather the architecture that it occurs. So on an Intel system, you're going to see a snapshot with Intel registers. On ARM, it's going to be different. So you kind of have to know, at least in this case, Mac OS, some ARM basics. Uh, we're not really going to cover those, but they're pretty straightforward. Next up, the crash report will also show you the loaded binaries, including their addresses and paths. This is important as well because the crash may not be in the main executable. It may be in one of its loaded libraries. What we do once we see where the crash occurs, we often load the binary into a disassembler and look at the disassembly to figure out exactly what went wrong. Now, I'm sure many of you know that when a binary, either the main executable or a library, is loaded into memory, because of security mechanisms like ASLR, the address is going to be moved. The binary is going to be shifted around, which means when we load it from a file on disk, there's going to be a mismatch in the addresses. 
From the crash report, though, we have the address that the binary was loaded. And so what we can do in the disassembler is rebase the file image so that it matches the in-memory one so that all the addresses align up. So this is a very important step. Finally, we have the address of the faulting instruction. I've mentioned the faulting instructions a few times. It's basically the actual line of code, essentially, that triggered the fault. This is normally where I start and then, in some cases, work backwards. So back to our example of the null pointer dereference, we can basically see that from the crash report, we have an address that ends in F78. If we go into disassembly to that same address, we can see that it's a store instruction where it's trying to store the W8 register, or the value in the W8 register, into the address pointed to by the X9 register. And if we go look at the crashed thread state, we can see that the X9 register holds zero. As I mentioned, you can't store something at memory address zero. This is a standard null pointer dereference, which if you remember, is exactly the bug we had in the source code. All right, so that was some crash report basics. TLDR from that section is there's a ton of really useful information that can ultimately show you why the program crashed. So what I want to now do is walk through some real life examples that make this a little more exciting. So I want to start with crash report, uh, a crash report that impacted Windows. Originally this talk was going to be all about Mac OS, but when the CrowdStrike event occurred, I just couldn't pass up that opportunity. So we're going to dive into that. I do want to give a shout out to TMac because he was super helpful uh, in working through this. Okay, so as I mentioned, Windows systems around the world started crashing. No one knew what was going on. Where did the answer lie? In the crash report. So we open up a crash report uh, on Windows. You do that in WinDBG. We can see that in the crash report, there is the address of the faulting instruction, also the thread state. And so from that, we can see we basically have a faulting instruction when it's trying to access some pointer value. And if we look at the address, which in this case is stored in the R8 register, we can see it's unmapped. So already we know that this is CrowdStrike's kernel driver, so it's not Microsoft's fault. And the bug appears to be accessing memory that is invalid. So let's dig into that a little bit deeper. So if we dig into this a little bit deeper, we can look at the disassembly of the faulting instruction, which is at number two. And the question then becomes, you know, why is that R8 register invalid? So what we do is we look a few instructions back, and we can see that the R8 register is, is uh, initialized with a value from what appears to be an array. If you've looked at a lot of disassembly, generally uh, you have an array with an offset. That, that is how you kind of like, that's what disassembly looks like, that uh, indexes into a, an array to grab something. And since we have some memory from the crash report as well, we can actually dump that array. And we can see that it appears to contain valid pointer values until we get to uh, index 20, decimal or 14 hex. And then immediately this one looks different than the rest. And if you recall from the crash report, this was the address that it tried to reference that was unmapped. And when you try to access unmapped memory in the kernel, you're going to cause a blue screen of death and a crash. And so this was you know, kind of the conclusion we came to, which is basically that the CrowdStrike kernel driver, for some reason, was accessing um, memory outside of an array. And eventually, CrowdStrike actually provided uh, confirmation of this after the fact, confirming our analysis. So the results from this were that we were able to debunk all the misinformation, people blaming Microsoft, people saying this was a null pointer exception, blah, blah, blah. And I tweeted about this, and then like the TV shows, like Good Morning America, were like, can you explain this to the general American public? And I was like, I will do my best. And you know, so I got to be on TV. And I was like, never in my wildest dreams would I have imagined that my 15 minutes of fame would come from talking about crash reports. So, that's kind of neat. And then my mom messaged me and she's like, can I have your autograph? And I don't know if she was like trolling me, but either way I'm going with it. And so, you know, my mom thinks I'm cool. Again, because of a crash report. So maybe that's really the takeaway from here is like, you crave like kudos from your parents, analyze crash reports. 
So that was uh, CrowdStrike, a great example of analyzing a crash report on Windows, uh, showing how we could answer the questions of what software crashed and why it crashed as well. Now I want to look at some crashes from Mac OS that I think are super interested, because Mac OS is really my area of expertise. I do also want to point out that these are all from my computer. And also for me just like using my computer. Like I wasn't fuzzing, I wasn't looking for bugs, I wasn't running malware, I was just like browsing around doing my daily thing. So I don't know what that says about Mac OS, but we'll leave that as a separate conclusion. So exactly, just to reiterate that, how do you generate crash reports? <laughs> Mac OS, <laughs> just use it. And I love this because this is like a great example. So I write a lot of security tools, um, and this actually is a great way to uh, I guess push the boundaries of what you're supposed to do on a system that a lot of times will reveal code that Apple hasn't tested as maybe much as it should be. So I was writing a DNS monitor. And yes, there was a bug in my DNS monitor. I'm not a perfect developer. So yes, I'm picking on other people, other people's software, but we'll see some examples of Patrick's code crashing as well. In this case, my DNS monitor crashed. When it crashed, it took down NS lookup and Apple's network extension session manager, which runs as root. And I was like, awesome. I mean, not awesome that it was like a bug in my software, but I was like, awesome that there's some like super interesting crash reports. Um, so again, like, if you need crash reports on Mac OS, like, just do your thing and, <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll be blessed. All right, so let's look at some uh, crash reports, and we're going to start with Lulu. Lulu is an open source firewall I wrote. As I mentioned, we're going to be picking on Apple. We already picked on CrowdStrike, so I thought it was only fair to also pick on me. So from the crash report, we can see that the exception code was a SIGBUS. Um, the rest of the exception codes really don't tell us too much, but if we look at the stack trace, and it's a little hard to see, but what we see is a deep repeating call stack. So after the first few calls, there is repetition showing that the function that gets called gets called over and over and over and over and over again until essentially we exhaust the stack. And when you see a SIGBUS exception and a repeating call stack leading to stack exhaustion, this is a classic sign of recursion gone wild. Basically, the recursion caused the stack space to be exhausted, and when that happens, that's going to cause the program to crash, which is going to generate a crash report. So since I had written this code, and it's also open source, it was actually pretty easy then to figure out exactly what went wrong. So the idea is Lulu is a firewall, and so it's going to alert users about outgoing network traffic. So imagine you have a browser, it had 50 tabs open, you closed it, you installed Lulu, and then you reopened your browser. All those 50 tabs are going to make network requests. So what Lulu did was it would alert the user about one of those requests and it would queue the rest, right? It's not going to generate 50 alerts. That would be annoying. It then waits for the user to say either allow or block, and then it would process the rest of those queues by recursively calling into the function. And this worked really well unless there were more than like 50 or 60 related flows. And apparently the stack on Mac OS is pretty short, so if you hit a few hundred recursion calls, you're actually going to run off the stack. So as soon as I saw that crash report and saw it was a crash because of recursion, I basically knew that it was because of this. So the fix was just to revert to an iterative approach, which actually really bummed me out, because I remember learning about recursion in computer science class, and I was like, this is cool. And like, till that day, I'd never used it. And so when I implemented recursion, I was like, hell yeah. And then it like broke my tool. <laughs> so to this day, I have not used recursion. And I'm sure you could do it right, but like, oh, I was really, I felt disenfranchised. But again, the crash report really pointed this out, ultimately allowed me to fix the software, and you know, everyone was happy. The next bug I encountered was in Yara. Many of you are probably familiar with Yara. It's a widely used framework library for basically doing pattern matching, detection, usually in the context of signature-based malware. So rather problematic if there's a crash, because again, this is widely deployed software. So I was playing around with Yara, and I noticed that when it scans certain binaries on Mac OS or certain files, it would crash. And if we look at the crash report, it's very interesting. We basically see the reason why it crashed is that there was an invalid code signature. 
Mac OS will kill you a lot of times if the code signature is invalid. But this was strange to me because the Yara library and tool I was using was validly signed, so the code signing wasn't involved in that. But looking at the crash report ultimately revealed what was going wrong. So when Yara wants to scan a file, what it does is it maps it into memory. Pretty standard. It then scans the mapped file to see if it matches any of the signatures, and if it's malware, it flags it, et cetera, et cetera. So I looked at the way that Yara, the open source version, was doing it, and I saw that they would map it uh, as read-only, as expected, right? They're just doing a read-only scan. And the, uh, the flag they used was map underscore private. Basically says this is a private mapping. Okay, so I didn't see any problems with that until I compared it with Apple's private Yara implementation and saw that when they mapped the file into memory to scan it, they used an Apple-specific flag, which is map resilient code sign. And what that means is that tells the operating system, even when I map something in that has an invalid signature, that's fine. So the problem was Yara wasn't using this like rather unknown Apple flag, so that when it would map in a file to scan, if that file had an invalid signature, the operating system would say, hey, you just mapped in some invalid code, and even though you've mapped it in as read-only, as soon as you go to access it, we're gonna crash the program. And that's just a design decision that Apple made. So the solution was then to simply map the files with that proprietary Apple flag that basically tells the operating system, hey, I know what I'm doing, I'm mapping in, binaries that might have invalid signatures, but that's okay, I'm not trying to run this memory, I'm just trying to do like a file scan. So when I figured it out, I was like, that's cool, I would have never figured that out without a crash report. And by understanding crash reports, I could then create a very detailed uh, bug report, which I submitted to the uh, Yara developers. They were great, they patched it like the next day, and they were like, interesting and very complete bug report. And that isn't to give me kudos, it just shows that if you understand crash reports and you use that to submit detailed bug reports to developers, the developers are going to love you. Because you know I was able to say, hey, it crashed, but this is why it crashed, and this is the fix. And so they were like, awesome. And we can see that their patch was simply to include uh, the extra flag, which also includes that resilient code signing flag. So now you can use Yara on your heart's content on Mac OS and it will no longer crash. Next we have Adobe's Crash Reporter. I'm mostly including this because it was hilarious that Adobe's Crash Reporter would crash. It's like, this is super meta. Um, and in this Crash Report, we can see there's actually information in the Crash Report that tells us exactly what went wrong. So it said, the application called CF released with null. If we look a little closer, in this case, the faulting instruction is going to be within the CF release API. There is not a bug in the CF release API. It's that it was called, as the crash report says, with null. So if you pass a null to a memory release, in this case, it's going to crash. So what we have to do is we have to look at the stack backtrace to figure out who or why they are calling it with null. So basically what we do is we find in the stack backtrace a call to this get logged in username, and if we disassemble or decompile that, we can see that they invoke an Apple API, SC dynamic store create, and if we read Apple's documentation about this, we see that on certain cases it can return a null value. What Adobe's crash report did not do was check the return value, and they would always go to free it. So on certain error conditions, this API would return a null. When they went to free it, they didn't check it with null. They would end up trying to release a null value, which would cause a crash in the crash reporter. Again, not an exploitable bug, but an interesting bug nonetheless. The fix was obviously just to check for null. I asked ChatGPT how to fix this code. Gave me a great explanation. I recommend Adobe do the same thing. All right, now onto another one of the tools I, write, I wrote. But in this case, we'll see this actually, thank goodness, was not my fault. So, Do Not Disturb is a simple application that will let you know if someone's mucking with your laptop. It was inspired by, and this is a true story, <laughs> a trip to Russia where I went out on a Tinder date and the woman turned out to be an uh, individual working for the Russian government. Uh, <laughs> yeah, amazing. But it inspired me to write, uh, we're no longer in contact for the record, and it inspired me to write this tool. 
which revealed a vulnerability in an Apple security API. So like, all's well that ends well. All right, so back to the tool, focus. Uh, <laughs> in certain cases, it would crash, and if we look at the crash report, the crash was in one of Apple's APIs. Now, I mentioned this a few times, that generally when you see a crash within an Apple API, it's because you called it with some incorrect values, right? On the last slide, we saw Adobe trying to free memory, passing in null, crashed in yes, an Apple API. The bug was not in the API, it was how it was invoked. So that was my first thought. I was like, okay, probably a bug in my software. But I then looked at what I was doing and I was really just trying to copy a public key and the key was like valid. And then I was like, okay, this is really strange. Like I don't see how I'm messing this up. So I decided to dig into a little deeper because again, from the crash report, we have a lot of information about where exactly it's crashing. So what I found was that we take the address of the faulting instruction, which is in the sec error API call. We look at what the faulting instruction is doing. And since the sec error API call is open source, we can map the disassembly of the faulting instruction to a line of code. And here we can see they're checking an error value to make sure it's not null. And if so, they are then dereferencing that. And that was the line of code that was causing the crash. And I was like, mm, that doesn't look too bad. So let's dig a little deeper. Well, long story short, we look at where this error value, which is a pointer, is declared. And we can see they declare it, but they don't set it to any value, meaning it's uninitialized. This is very problematic because it means that when they go to use it, it's just going to point to random memory. And that random memory, if it's unmapped, could lead to uh, a crash, as it did, uh, and then take the whole program down. Kind of interesting. Uh, and even more interesting is if you actually took the code and copied it into, or opened it in Xcode, the compiler would actually recognize this and throw a warning saying, like, error variable or variable error is uninitialized. So this is a little problematic because this means like Apple is ignoring compiler warnings. Um, and in this case, accessing an uh, uninitialized variable, especially in a pointer, does have security implications. Uh, so in that case, Apple actually patched this bug, uh, gave it a CVE, kind of neat. Again, I wasn't looking for bugs, just writing software that triggered this, uh, in this case, turned out to be a bug in Apple's code. Okay, let's talk about the kernel. Again, one of my other tools would cause a kernel panic. That was annoying. I'd like test the tool, go surfing, come back, and like my box had panicked. I'm strange. When I get a kernel panic, <laughs> yes, I'm annoyed that like my computer shut down, but I'm really excited because I'm like, ooh, cool. Like, what's, what's the reason? And here I assume that it wasn't my tool because my tool only contained user mode code. And so, yes, clearly my tool was triggering something that was creating a kernel panic, but like that was going to be an Apple's code. So if we look at the crash report, we can see that it's a page fault and we have the address of unmapped memory. So all we know is that the kernel is crashing, cool, because it's trying to access some unmapped memory. So let's look and figure out why. So we have the address of the faulting instruction. So we load the kernel into a disassembler. We then go to that address and we can see that what they're doing is they are comparing a pointer for zero. This part of the kernel is open source. So again, we can map the disassembly, the faulting instruction, to the source code. And we can see what they're doing is they're simply trying to check that a path is null terminated. Okay, but for some reason, they are going outside the bounds of that check. And so here's kind of a diagram showing exactly what was going wrong. And in some cases, it was a traditional off by one. Basically, if you look at the code, they are using the length of the buffer as an index. And since the buffers start at zero, right, you should always do like length minus one. Now normally that wasn't a problem because it was just a read. You know, they're not trying to write to that memory address. But if that buffer happened to be aligned or rather end on a page boundary and the next page in kernel memory wasn't mapped in, when the off by one triggered, that would cause an invalid memory access which in the kernel would cause a panic. So that bug unto itself is not super interesting. I mean, it's not like exploitable. Uh, you know, yeah, kernel panic is problematic, but like I always kind of want something more. But I still report it to Apple because like my 
tool was causing a kernel panic, and users like to yell at you when they do that. So I was like, Apple, you need to fix this so that I don't get yelled at anymore. And now let's talk about <laughs> Apple's fix, which is hilarious. So remember, they're trying to check if a buffer is null terminated. That's important so that you could do like string operations. So they even have a comment in the code that says that's what they're trying to do. Make sure the path is null terminated. And so what they did is they replaced the null termination check with a call to basically a stir copy, a stir L copy, which is a safe stir copy. But what does stir copy need? A null terminated string. And remember, there's no guarantee that this string is null terminated. That's what they were checking in the first place. So their fix was to do a stir copy without checking for nulls, which basically means they would just start copying random kernel memory after the buffer up until they either encountered a null or an unmapped page, which basically meant they introduced a kernel information leak, which I was like, what? Guys, come on, do your job. <laughs> so I reported that back. I was like, you just made this worse, right? Before we had like an off by one read, kind of a useful bug, your fix was just so insanely wrong and actually introduced a kernel information leak, which is a real security bug. Like, what is going on in Cupertino? Like, stop smoking the drugs. <laughs> Meanwhile, I said, you know what? This function has some strange code, and Apple clearly has no idea what's going on. Let me look a few lines back. And as I did that, I noticed that there was, again, this is in, a, in the kernel, a B copy, which is essentially a memory copy on attacker-controlled values, specifically a length that is bigger than the buffer that they're copying into. This is a standard, quintessential uh, kernel heap overflow uh, in the kernel, which is great. So again, from the crash report, we found a uh, you know, kind of problematic bug. Apple's fix was even worse, and a few lines above that was an exploitable heap overflow. So thank you, crash report. Now, this next bug I want to talk about is in iOS. This wasn't actually on my computer, but this was my fault. So I have a friend. Uh, she's Taiwanese, and I would text her. If you know me, I love emojis. So I'd always like text her, like, what's happening in Taiwan today? Is China invaded? And then I would like send the Taiwanese flag. And she would always be like, Patrick, whenever you text me, like, my phone crashes. She's like, are you hacking me? And I was like, rude. Like, I don't hack my friends. And also, if I hacked your phone, it wouldn't crash. So I am doubly offended. But anyways, I was like, let's look into this because, you know, something's happening and a remote iOS crash, like, might be kind of interesting. So I pulled the crash report from her phone and again, we see what's crashing. In this case, it was the SMS application. Uh, and if we look at the stack backtrace, we can see that in the call stack is core emoji, which is the library that involves with is involved with processing emojis on iOS, which kind of makes sense. And as the demo shows, we can see whenever she typed Taiwan, which would then suggest emojis, such as the Taiwanese flag, some foreboding going on, it would actually crash as well. So we have some information that we can dig into. So again, we, we do the standard approach. We get the faulting instruction, load the library that contains that code, look in the disassembly and figure out what's going wrong. And in this case, we find an instruction where it's loading LDR, the load arm instruction, uh, something from the X21 register into X8. And if we look at the X21 register in the crashed thread state in the crash report, we can see it's zero. So a null pointer dereference. Not exploitable, but as we'll see, still interesting. We also can see that the faulting instruction is within Apple's CF string compare. It's not a bug in CF compare, but if you do a string compare and you pass in a null pointer, it's going to crash. So the question then is, why is the string compare API being invoked with a null pointer? And this is where things get interesting. And the answer is, because of Apple's acquiescing to the Chinese government to try to hide or block the Taiwanese flag. Insane, right? So, here is the iOS code. We can see that they were trying to get the locale of the phone, it's like where the phone is or what language settings it has. And then they would compare that locale to see if it was CN or China. If so, they would then invoke the logic to basically hide or remove the Taiwanese flag. Chinese government obviously doesn't recognize Taiwan, went to Apple and was like, yeah, it's not okay if the Taiwanese flag is being shown. 
And Apple, which claims to be this bastion of caring about its users, was like, yeah, sure, Chinese government, we'll do what you say. Uh, and basically tried to remove the Taiwanese flag. The bug was that getting the locale could fail, it could return null, so that when they compared it against CN for China, X19 in that case would uh, be that null value, which would cause the crash. So again, not the most interesting bug in terms of exploitability, but it did confirm the fact that Apple was censoring logic uh, to, again, appease the requests of the Chinese government. So again, and we could find this and prove this from the crash report. Okay. Let's now turn our attention to more recent crash reports uh, that I believe are all zero days in macOS. The first one is in Apple's keychain access application. This one was interesting because of the entitlements. So entitlements are extra capabilities that applications can have on macOS. And the keychain access application has a lot of entitlements because it needs to access the keychain, which is where user passwords, private certificates, all the good juicy things are um, stored. It has access to that, random malware does not. So if there's a bug in the Keychain Access app, that is problematic. So we look at the crash report, we see that there is an uh, invalid address, and it says that the address uh, that was accessed is because of the possible pointer authentication error, failure, or a pack error. Anytime you see that, this is an interesting bug report. It basically means memory corruption has occurred. So this is a good kind of crash report to look. If we look at the stack backtrace, we can see that it um, is crashing in a CF retain, which isn't that interesting, but it's based on accessing, um, for example, the sex certificate get data API. So something's going on with Apple security libraries. Since this is happening on my box, I can simply attach a debugger, trigger the fault, and then I can debug the crash, which is really nice because I have way more context than what is afforded to me in the crash report. But still, from the crash report, I know where to set breakpoints, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we can see that it's crashing specifically um, in a call to the certificate get data API. And in a debugger, what we can do is we can dump the arguments, and we can see that the problem was is you could coerce the keychain to pass the wrong type of object to this API. So looking at the documentation, it says that the first argument should be a certificate. This makes sense because the API is called certificate get data. So it expects a certificate. However, in the debugger, we can print out x0, which contains the first argument, the parameter, and we can see that it is not a certificate, but rather it's a key, right? It's a sec CDSA key reference. Obviously, if you pass a key object to an API that's expecting a certificate object, this is a object type confusion issue, and at worst or best, it will crash. At worst, there are opportunities perhaps to uh, exploit this. So that was interesting. The next bug I'm gonna talk about is in Apple's system extension daemon. This is an interesting bug because it has implication for security tools. So a little bit of backstory. Uh, about five years ago, Apple decided to kick third-party kernel extensions out of the kernel. They basically didn't like the amount of control that this afforded third-party developers. And also, obviously, there are security risks with allowing third-party code running in the kernel, as CrowdStrike clearly illustrated. So when the CrowdStrike issue happened, Apple smugly was like, yeah, this can't happen to us. Like, we kicked everyone out. And to be fair, they were right. But the problem was, as we will see, their implementation to support the booting out everyone from kernel mode was riddled was, is riddled with security flaws. So like, I'm not sure that they should quite be patting themselves on the back yet. So to facilitate, facilitate the same capabilities that were previously afforded to third-party developers in the kernel, Apple implemented system extensions. So system extensions you can think of as basically user mode kernel drivers. You know, if you're writing a firewall, if you are writing a security product that normally would have run in the kernel, you now run in user mode as a system extension. And you can pretty much do the same amount of powerful things. You can block processes, you can sniff packets, et cetera, et cetera. So TLDR, system extensions, user mode drivers. And to manage that, Apple has the system extension daemon. Okay, so what happened here? I was writing a system extension daemon. I messed something up, 
as I do <laughs> a lot, apparently. And when I submitted my request to the system extension daemon to load my extension, it, it, it crashed. And I was like, odd. So if we look at the crash, uh, crash report, we can see that it's in the system extension daemon. Uh, we can also see user ID is zero, means it's running as root, always interesting. Uh, but we see the crash occurs in uh, assertion. So I looked into that a little bit more, and it's basically, in this case, if the client disconnected, it would trigger an assertion, and uh, the way the assertion handled would be to crash the program. Design decision, maybe not the best. So I looked where else in the disassembly were there assertion checks that if they would occur, instead of them being handled gracefully, the system extension daemon would just crash. Uh, and I found an interesting one where basically it checked the number of architectures in the system extension that was being loaded. A little more backstory on Mac OS, you can have what are known as universal or fat binaries. These are binaries that have multiple architectures. One, for example, for Intel and one for ARM. This means you can have the same binary that runs on multiple architectures. At runtime, the loader selects the right one. Super useful uh, feature of the operating system. So when you loaded a system extension, there was a check to make sure that the architectures were not set to zero. Because like, if you did, that wouldn't make sense. But again, instead of like gracefully handling that and just refusing to load the system extension, which was clearly like a corrupt or invalid one, uh, the logic, the code decided to like just crash. I guess they were like, yeah, we're done. And so in this case, we could take a system extension, we could just uh, knock out the number of architectures that's in the second D word. Usually you should be set to like one or two, you know, depending if you have one for Intel, ARM, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in the case of zero, it will trigger that, uh, that assertion, which would then cause the crash. And this is problematic because it means unprivileged malware can simply make multiple requests to the system extension daemon and just crash it, which means no other security tool can load. So for example, when someone comes along and tries to install Lulu, or if Lulu was already installed, the firewall, it would no longer be allowed, would not, it would no longer be able to load because the system extension daemon that is responsible for loading is like in the background crashing because of this assertion logic failure. Okay, the last bug I wanna talk about is in a similar component in the network extension session manager. This is another piece of Apple's run drivers in user mode that is specifically related to network extensions. Network extensions are any system extension that are involved with network. So VPN, DNS monitors, firewalls, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I found this because I had a bug in a network extension I was developing. So in this case, we look at the crash report and we can see that in the crash backtrace, there is a call to a string initialization function and then it crashes ultimately in the respond to selector method. The respond to selector method is an Objective-C function that basically introspects an object to see if it can handle uh, a function request, essentially. And it's called all the time. And if you see a crash within this API, it's not a bug in the API, it's that an invalid object or some corrupted memory was passed to it. So we need to figure out, you know, why. So, Looking at the disassembly and from the stack backtrace, we ultimately figure out the real cause of the bug. So what they're trying to do is print a localized string when an error condition occurs. And so what they do is they first try to look up the localized format string. And if you see how they do it, they pass in a format string and a key. And the format string is percent at, percent at, percent at, percent s. An Objective-C, Swift, percent at means an Objective-C object, percent s means a C string. The problem is the format string, the localized format string they get back, if we look at it, it has a percent at, percent at, percent at, and then a percent at. That's very, very problematic because they essentially have a object mismatch in the format string. They basically say, hey, we're gonna pass in a C string, which is a sequence of bytes, to something that is expecting a Objective-C object, or vice versa. And we can see this in a debugger. Again, this is happening locally on my machine. I can set a breakpoint here and step through to get more context. So again, we get this format string that has percent at. This is a placeholder for an Objective-C object. 
We can see what they are doing, though, is passing a C string. If you pass a C string, which again, is just a sequence of bytes to a uh, function or a format string that per is expecting an object, it's going to crash and burn. Now, again, being able to crash the network system extension manager doesn't really seem like too much of a problem at first, except for the fact that when it crashes, it unloads every single other network extension that's up and running. So what this means is untrusted, unprivileged malware can make a request to the network, ex network extension daemon, the session manager, trigger this crash, and then it will unload all the other security tools, firewalls, VPNs, that are up and running. So clearly that's very problematic. And really, I think, goes back to counter some of Apple's claims about how great they are for moving everything from the kernel to user mode. Because again, one of the values of running your code in the kernel is that unprivileged malware can't just unload it. Whereas now on Mac OS, you can like unload any network extension, like. Patrick's firewall or other security tools, like that to me is really problematic. You can also use this to terminate the network, uh, which might be useful if you're ransomware trying to prevent backups, or a lot of security tools do cloud-based analysis, so malware could trigger the network extension, get the security tools to unload, and basically take down the network, um, and then do its, its maliciousness. All right. Clearly, I could talk about this all day. I have a long list of other crash reports from my Mac, and some of them are like in really interesting things. I mean, we have like in, uh, let's see, like in Apple's virtualization frameworks, um, you know, we have some payment stuff, Windows servers, all the good things. So you'll probably hear about, about this more, but you know, if you look on your system, you probably have some very interesting crash reports as well. So I definitely recommend um, digging into that. Okay. Let's wrap this up. I know this is getting long. I briefly want to talk about automated collection and analysis of crash reports, because hopefully you're like, yeah, crash reports are awesome. Like, how do I collect them? How do I analyze them? So the idea is pretty straightforward. The idea is we are just going to watch for new files being added to the crash report directories. And when we see this, we basically know that there is a new crash report that, that we can then ingest in order to analyze and determine if it's a crash report of interest. Thanks to Apple's endpoint security framework, it's super easy to write basically a file monitor. Uh, we can do that using something known as mute inversion. Uh, the idea is the endpoint security allows you to subscribe to events, for example, new file events, but we'll do that globally. So what we need to do is we need to tell the framework that we are actually going to, that actually we only care about specific directories, uh, in this case the crash reporter directories, and again you do this with mute inversion. So here's some example code, I'm not going to walk through the code, that's boring, this is more for a resource if you want to write a crash report monitor, this is one very effective way to do that. So now we have the ability to detect when new crash reports are generated. Let's imagine we're now collecting those to do some back-end processing. That honestly could be a whole talk unto itself. Like, given a crash report, how do we determine if it's useful, right? But there's a few things I just want to mention. Um, first and foremost, you can identify the process. And if it's not a process of interest, like, who cares? Like, if Xcode crashes, if, like, calculator crashes, like, meh. But if it's like the browser or like signal or the kernel, like those are things that you probably want to take a closer look. Also, if it's a crash in an assertion, it's probably not something you care about because it basically means that the system has caught something funky and has decided to crash. Unless it's something like Apple's system extension manager that is problematic if that goes down. But most assertions are kind of junk. Also, if the crash is on the main thread in a UI application, I generally tend to ignore those. The reason being, Apple's UI frameworks are notoriously buggy, so they kind of crash all the time. And also, those crashes often require user interaction. So if you're like an offensive-minded individual, like requiring user interaction to trigger a bug, like that's kind of not that interesting, especially if it's like they have to click here and then scroll here. So, UI crashes, I, I generally um, ignore. That having said, like background threads are usually the ones doing like the parsing of maybe remote data or something else. Those are generally more interesting. 
Okay, let's wrap this up with some conclusions, takeaways, and then we'll drink more beer. All right, so crash reports should be your new best friends, right? They can highlight bugs that you can fix uh, or you can exploit. They can also uncover malware and failed exploitation attempts. Okay, so again, round of hands. Who now loves crash reports? Okay, great, that's awesome. That is a big improvement. I am stoked. So if you're interested in learning more, I've written a book on analyzing Mac malware. It doesn't specifically talk about crash reports, but it talks about a lot of reverse engineering. It's 100% free online. You can also uh, order it on Amazon. Um, and volume two is shortly gonna be uh, released. It's off to the publisher next few months. And volume two is all about writing software that detects malware and other malicious things, exploitation attempts. T-Mac is the technical editor, so again, T-Mac, you are the man. Mahalo. <laughs> There's a joke about that, you'll have to ask Tom. Um, and briefly also, I wanna take a, um, a second to, to mention the Objective-C Foundation. We do a lot of really cool stuff. We have the OBTS conference, which I look around, I see uh, many friendly faces of attendees and even speakers. So if you're interested in Mac OS and iOS talk, it's all about that, super cool. We also do college scholarships, diversity programs, so check that out. Uh, and speaking of thanks, I also want to take a moment to thank the companies and the products that uh, sponsor the foundation. They are the ones that allow us to do all the awesome stuff we do. So if you know anybody that works at these companies, buy them a beer, give them a pat on the back. And that is a wrap. So are there any questions before I give the mic back to Tom? Or Becker. So the question was, did Apple end up fixing the Taiwan bug? They did, which is good. Um, I have noticed that I generally report bugs to Apple, um, and Apple eventually gets around to fixing them sometimes. But what I have learned, and this is just great advice, uh, if you want Apple to fix them something, uh, make sure there's some bad press attached to it. <laughs> you laugh, but it's true. <laughs> like, a lot of times they're like, ah, oh, we don't care about this. And like, I've run into so many cases where I'm like, this is a problematic bug. And they're just like, yeah, whatever, go away. But as soon as the media picks up on it and is like, Apple is censoring Taiwan and that bug is crashing, like, they will fix it immediately. So, good story, or, or good conclusion is that did motivate Apple to fix it. Uh, I think it also reiterated the fact that Apple is a large corporation that is focused on making money, which is fine. And sometimes that means acquiescing to the demands of foreign governments, which is maybe not fine. But that's just a good thing to know. Um, so that was, yeah, a very interesting story. Um, you know, my friend's happy. I can text her Taiwanese uh, <laughs> emojis. I'm actually going to Taiwan for a conference, so we'll, we'll see if I get stopped on entering. But, um, but yeah, Apple did fix that pretty quickly, especially after the... Uh, the unflattering press, let's just say. So I, I, I love running that angle because it really helps get bugs fixed. Yeah, Matt. All right, so, well, are you done? No. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, I love the press too, so. <laughs> All right, so two questions. One's a follow-on to that one, sort of, and that's, did you run with that thread and look at other locale-specific stuff to see any other things of interest that might be getting censored? Yeah, yeah. And the second question is, in Windows, you have the ability to set up a crash dump server and say, I want mm. my dumps to go here. Does Mac OS seem to have that sort of feature? Ooh, great questions. So the first question about digging more into other censorship logic, I have not. That's actually a very good idea. It'd be really interesting to see. Um, you know, once I understood what they were doing with the Taiwanese flag, there was some other research showing that people had anecdotally seen that. Um, and, you know, but it would be interested in, like, what else and, and under what conditions. Um, you know, the, you know, obviously, that would only, Apple designed that to only trigger for uh, Chinese iPhones or iPhones that had their locale set to CN. So, yeah, that's not something, like, us would generally see. So it would be interesting to, you know, maybe look for calls for, you know, CF get locale and see what that, so that would be super interesting, so. Great idea, love that, I'm gonna run with that. Um, in terms of a crash server, I haven't seen that and I'd actually be surprised. 
Uh, Windows is usually great about giving people a lot of control in the sense like, yeah, if you want your own crash server, do that. Apple's always like, no, nah, this is coming to us or stuff. So I haven't seen anything, but that would be great. I mean, if they did support that, um, obviously that would make things a lot easier. Uh, for example, I know on iOS to like get the crash logs off, you have to like manually go to the phone and either pull them off yourself or plug it in and set some trust thing. Like it's very, very, very difficult to like programmatically pull crash reports off an iPhone. And I understand there's like security, usability, trade, privacy trade-offs, but generally speaking, Apple doesn't make these things easy, so I would be very surprised. But again, something very good to look into because if they did, and I'm running a company or an enterprise with Macs, I'm just setting that configuration and then collecting all the crash reports versus having to deploy an agent that's monitoring them locally. So, but I would be, again, surprised if Apple did that. It's just not something they generally are stoked about, so. Any other questions? Awesome, well thank you all so much for attending my talk, and also thank you to Casey T. Mac, Jailbreak for hosting this amazing event. I mean, we get to like take off a Friday and drink beer at the brewery and talk nerdy, like, so round of applause for them all.